All right, guys, we, we are being used in different places. Where you are is crucial. Forge is about building great men as God defines greatness, and then we get to make a difference wherever we are in the greater Orlando area, in our families, in our work, in our churches, and uh, so uh, we get to make a difference in so many different places. Today we begin a new series. New series, it's called what? First Things. First Things, the story from the beginning. We're going to start a 10-week study in the book of Genesis which is the first book of the Bible. So the story from the beginning, first things. What Genesis is going to do is going to help us ask the right questions about life. And so I want to tell you a story about uh, asking the right questions. Um, a new story one of you guys sent me, it's very important. A Russian Jew was finally allowed to immigrate uh, to Israel. You know, you can't always get out of uh, Russia and get to Israel, but this Russian Jew was allowed to immigrate uh, to, to Israel. At the Moscow airport, uh, a, uh, a custom official found in the man's bag a statue of Lenin, and, and he asked, what is this? And, and the man said, no, what is this? That's the wrong question, comrade. You should have asked, who is this? He, this is Comrade Lenin. He laid the foundations for socialism and created the future and prosperity of the Russian people. I'm taking it with me as a memory of our dear hero. And the uh, Russian customs official said, fine, go, go, go. At Tel Aviv, when he landed in Israel, the Israeli customs officer asked our friend, what is this? And he said, no, that's not the right question. The question is, who is this? This is Lenin, the evil tyrant who caused me, a Jew, to leave Russia. I take this statue with me every day and everywhere I go so I can curse his name. The Israeli customs official said, I apologize, sir, you're clear to go. Settling into his new home, he had his other relatives come over. They had a, a, a party, an immigration uh, party, and there was the statue uh, of Lenin sitting there. One of his friends said, who is this? And he said, no, 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 that's the wrong question. Who is this is wrong. You should have asked, what is this? This is 10 kilograms of solid gold that I managed to bring with me without paying customs duty and a tax. <laughs> Moral of the story, you ready? Politics is when you can tell the same lies in different ways to fool a different audience to allow you to look good in every way. Sorry to our politicians, you know I don't mean that really about you. Um, uh, but the reality is uh, uh, we have to learn to ask the right questions. And on a less cynical note, what Genesis does is it helps us ask the right questions about the reality that we see around us, about how we live our world and interpret things in our world. Uh, it's, it's important to ask the right questions about life. That's what we mean when we bring up the whole issue of world view. You got it? World view is the subject of how people view, look at the world. And there is a Christian world view that starts in the Bible. In Genesis, in the book of Genesis. In fact, in the book of Genesis, what God does is he begins to build a long-term, full-orbed view of how we ought to see the world, interpret the world, and, and analyze those things that happen around us by people who do not share our world view. And that's why this is extremely important. Uh, in Philosophy 101, I, that I, I remember taking in junior college, um, I, I made the mistake when the professor said, how many of you are Christians, by raising my hand and thinking, wait a minute, this is a secular, and six of us raised our hands, and then we go, oh shoot, what did we do? Uh, and then he looked at us and he said, in six weeks I'll prove to you God doesn't exist. Now obviously it didn't take, but the reality is he had a different worldview. And in philosophy, we used to study, do you remember that? Those of you who took philosophy, uh, talking about the ultimate nature of reality. We used to love that phrase. Uh, after class, we'd say, how are you doing? Well, I'm dealing with the ultimate nature of reality. 
You could use that today, by the way. But that's, that's in, in, in reality what the ancient Greeks were doing. They didn't interact with, they didn't interact with the Hebrews. They didn't ask for holy Torah, Torah, which means instruction, the first five books of the Bible. The ancient Greeks didn't go to the Jews and say, how do we understand the world? The ancient Greeks got rid of their old gods and they said, let's try to figure out how life works without God. Let's, let's construct a worldview of our own without God. That's what Greek philosophy is. That's what you, why you had to take the philosophers. Uh, uh, Aristotle, Socrates, all of these guys, what were they doing? They were trying to construct a worldview, understand reality without reference to God. Interesting. You ever see the Power Rangers or your kids ever watch the Power Rangers? Uh, it was a cartoon. Earth, wind, and fire. And the Power Rangers had the power. Well, where does that come from? Ancient Greek philosophy. The early Greek philosophers said, what is the ultimate nature of reality? What drives the world? What makes the world go round? What makes things happen? Earth. Others said, no, it's the wind. Others said, nope, it's water. Others said, nope, it's fire. They explored all of those things as the ultimate ground of being, the ultimate nature of reality, that which makes the world go. That was their worldview, and many people have lived with those worldviews. Christian worldview is different. So as we study Genesis, we're going to be, we're going to be getting God's worldview. And today, uh, we're going to be looking at how to understand the world, the first steps in building the worldview as we look in Genesis. Now, somebody's going to ask, why is this so important? On your outline, I want you to understand why this is so important. Uh, the, the first point I have down there is the worldview, what do I call it? The worldview war. Gentlemen, uh, so, many, so many Christians, so many Americans are saying, what's going on in America? Why is it so different? Why are we going through such a, a radical change in American culture? What's going on? Well, we are having a worldview war. Has the worldview war been going on for some time? It's been going on all my life, all your life, and, and really after the founding of this country, which was based on biblical principles, even some of our founding fathers didn't really buy into the biblical worldview, but they championed the biblical worldview. I mean, it was Franklin uh, who said, um, we need to have prayer in, in Congress. And he was a deist. He believed at best that God created the world and then took off and set up these principles and God really wasn't involved in our lives. And so that was the world, but the worldview that this country was founded upon was the Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. And, and since then, it's been under assault. Uh, but what we're seeing here today is what was a cold war before is now a hot war. What was under the surface before is now on the surface. Uh, what, what used to be only in education is now in every manner of life, isn't it? Education, entertainment, uh, politics, uh, you name it, it's there. It's on the surface, it's in your face. It's game on. We have a worldview war. We have the Judeo-Christian worldview that still is extant in America. It's still working, and you hold it, I hope, mostly. But you know, my question is going to be, as we talk about the worldview, which elements of a Christian, Judeo-Christian, biblical worldview am I going to point out, and you're going to go, whoa, I don't hold that. Why are our churches so divided today? You know why? Because we have many Christians who've bought another worldview and other Christians who don't, don't we're, worldview wars, are they in the church? Yep, every church. Is it in our country? Yep. And it's so important that we understand that this has now bubbled to the surface. And my job is to make sure at Forge we think biblically, think God's thoughts after him, and to keep us on mission. So that's why uh, part of what we're doing here as we get into Genesis is uh, talk about the story 
from the beginning and, and know how to think about God. As uh, one warrior put it, uh, the most important reason a man can take into combat is the reason why. The most important reason a man can take into combat is the reason why he's going into combat. And we need to, a lot of Christians don't want to fight. I know, I get that. By the way, I get that, right? Just want, every, can't we all just get along? Can't we just, no. No. Because it's in your face and on the surface. And so, let's jump in. You got your Bibles? Uh, t- if you got your Bibles, you can bring your Bibles here, by the way, and it would be a good idea. Or get your technology. Uh, Genesis 1. Uh, maybe you have this memorized. If, if you have this memorized, I would like to meet you. Um, but here it is. I'm not going to read all of Genesis 1 and 2. We're doing two chapters. <laughs> Bishop is laughing at me. I love it. Pastors go, yeah. Because I always caution, do not take too big of a chunk. We're taking two chapters. Ready? Because Genesis has how many chapters, brothers? 50 chapters. And I just, I know of a pastor who just finished a series in the book of Genesis, two and a half years. I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, The rapture might happen. You might not be here in two and a half years. Uh, So here it is. Genesis 1-1. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Genesis 1 continues the second day, talking about the uh, separation of the waters because as the world is created, boom, uh, there, there is mist all over and God separates on the second day. He separates the waters so that there is, is an expanse, what we call the sky today. That took place on the second day. The third day, the waters were gathered in one place on earth and dry land appeared and vegetation. Notice the phrase as you read Genesis 1, after their kind. After their kind. On the fourth day, lights in the expanse took place to separate the day from the night, signs for seasons and for days and years, sun and moon. Fifth day, waters teem with life, birds, sea monsters. I like that. I mean, those, those humongous, those humongous mahi-mahi that you guys pull in. Uh, okay, yeah, it could be whales, could be dolphins, could be other things, big, big uh, sea animals. Uh, uh, but uh, the birds were there. You wing hunters like that. Uh, pheasant, duck, turkey hunters. God did that for you. Uh, and the fishers. But all of that, the waters team. Now look at day six, verse 24. Then God said... Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Six days of good, 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 good. Well, last day it's very good. Then God said, let us plural, make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I give you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It should be food for you and every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything. I've given every, God is generous. He's just given so much. Now go to Genesis 2 verse 15. Because Genesis 2, and some say, why do we have a Genesis 2 if we've already got a Genesis 1? 
Well, we've got a Genesis 2 to fill in details that go, uh, that fit into the Genesis 1 account. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, he gets more detailed. Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you shall, what? Surely die. Then God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. Man, I say this at every wedding I do. I, the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. I look at the groom and I say, Is that, is that right, Bill? And he always goes, You bet, man. It's not good. Um, I'll make a helper suitable for him. He has to say, yeah, of course, he's on the... Yeah. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what it would name them, or whatever the man called the living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the bird, gave names to all of them. And so God brings all of the animals to the man, and, and, and for what reason? To show the man that there was... Nobody for him. So God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he takes the rib out of his side and closes up the flesh in its place. And he fashioned the woman from the side of man. Uh, verse 24 says something very important. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife uh, were naked, not ashamed. Wow, there's a whole lot there. And you've rightly uh, understood that I skipped over a ton. We're, we're not going to deal with all of this because we don't have time. But I'm going to emphasize the most important so that we ask the right questions about worldview. Because some of the questions that people ask of the book of Genesis are not the questions that Genesis is trying to answer. You understand that, guys? Catch that in mind, that when every biblical author from Genesis to Revelation, whenever they wrote a book of the Bible, there was a reason the author had an intent. Theologians call that authorial intent. There was a tent, an intent of the author when he wrote the book. And many people today are, are, are looking at Genesis and they're saying, what does Genesis, why doesn't it answer this question? Because God's intent through the human author was not to answer every question that you and I might bring of it uh, so many centuries later. That's a very important point. Genesis is not trying to answer all the questions, but it is trying to answer many questions. The question we need to answer is, first of all, what does it tell us about God? It tells us a lot about God. It tells us his name. What's his name? In the original Hebrew, we find out that in Genesis 1, the name Elohim is used the most. El is uh, the, the Hebrew word for God. Elohim is plural, gods. God is given the plural Elohim. Why? Uh, it's probably uh, because it's God that they're talking about. A plural of majesty. Is it a foreshadowing of the Trinity? Perhaps, because soon we see the Spirit of God moving over the waters. And so that's, it's too quick to, in the Bible to talk about Trinity, but it's certainly an indication of that. We see the name of God. In Genesis 2, the name of God is Yahweh, from the verb to be, which is the covenant name of God. We learn God's name. And for the biblical Jew, it's important for us to understand the biblical view of God from the Jewish standpoint was that God was Elohim. Yahweh Elohim. God Almighty. So holy that his name had to be carefully uttered. To this day, biblical Jews, sometimes when they're writing, most of the times when they're writing, will put G-D because they don't want to defame and cause the name of God to be blasphemed. The name of God to the Jew is holy because of his important work. We see that he is the creator. God is the first, catch this guys, this is important. God is the first subject in the Bible and the most important subject in the Bible. 
The first verb in the Bible is create. And the most important subject in the Bible, God, is the one who creates. And he is holy, holy, holy. This speaks of God's self-existence. His aseity is uh, the theological term. His self-existence. In other words, the Bible never tries to prove there's a God. Interesting, right? From Genesis 1-1 to the book of Revelation. There's never an argument that says, this is why you should believe in God. The Bible just presupposes that God exists. He is the uncaused cause, the most necessary being in the universe because without God, there's nothing else. In the beginning, there was nothing. And God, the most important subject of the Bible, created life and all that comes. Uh, and, and so in a very real sense, to, to contemplate, gentlemen, and do, contemplate non-existence if you can. And then contemplate all things coming into being by a God who speaks and out of nothing comes something, comes creation, comes order, comes beauty, comes all of these things. The, the, the Latin term is creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. You and I create things. You guys are more creative than I am. We create things. We build things. But we build out of existing materials. Working on your house, you, you got to go to Lowe's and buy a $40 uh, uh, sheet of plywood. 50 60, like I said, you can't get it, all right? But, but if you can get the materials, you, can, you build out of existing materials. God speaks. Let this blow your mind. Take some time and contemplate this. Contemplate deep space. Go out at night and look at the, what it's clear and look and contemplate and let it blow your mind. The problem is, is that too few Christians ever have an exalted view of God. They simply have too small a view of God. And the reason why Moses was writing this was to tell us about God. Because what he is trying to do, remember when Moses is writing this? Do you understand when he's writing this? When the Jews are leaving uh, Egypt. He's writing this because the Jews had spent 400 years in Egyptian bondage. They think like Jews, or excuse me, they think like Egyptians. And he wants them to think like the people that they are. And so that's why he's writing this. He's not writing this to, to confirm everything and, and, and collate everything with modern science. The Bible was written in a pre-scientific age to pre-scientific people who needed to understand who they really were, their identity. And that's why he's writing, telling them that God is uh, Yahweh Elohim, that he's powerful, that he's creative, that he's generous, uh, that he is bigger than they could ever, ever imagine. And the Jews had to understand their true identity, that they were the people of God, chosen, created specially by God. You read the Egyptian creation narratives and the Babylonian creation narratives. Any of you have done that? I know some of you have. Whew, they're weird. But the biblical narrative, which is an ancient narrative, is very straightforward. Not the planets collided and the God this was created from this planet coming apart and this happening and, part of, and human beings came from the wife of this God or this, it's just weird. When you read Genesis, it's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He took Adam from the dirt and formed him from the dust, it says, but uh, even more than that, uh, as we'll see in just a second, uh, it was his uh, dignity. Guys, it's so important to understand that the worldview that we are really up against is a worldview that refutes everything in Genesis. The worldview that is attacking us is a worldview that is against this basic creation account. What our world is teaching us about God is that there is no God. And that the world either existed eterni eternally, that matter is eternal, or that it just came into existence all by itself. All kinds of implications in that worldview as it attacks the Christian worldview. But the Jews needed to know that God created them.
You need to know that. What does is, what is the what does Genesis teach us about humanity? Real quick, I'll, I'll say some things about you and me, and then and then we'll talk about it around your table. Because from Genesis, we learn uh, that humankind, Adama, Adam, uh, Adama, the plural, uh, uh, which speaks of male and female. Adam's name represents all of humanity. Adam, Adama, male and female, is the crown of creation. It's fascinating when you read the accounts in Genesis, you see all of this stuff taking place, and then you get down to the end of Genesis chapter 1, and then again in Genesis 2 when it talks about the creation of man. And, and, and you see, you can't miss it. Are the plants made in the image of God? Answer? No. How about the rocks? Are they made in the image of God? Nope. How about the, the beasts of the sea? Nope. When you shoot a turkey, are you killing something made in the image of God? No, you're, you're, you eat that thing because it's not in the image of God. He was given to you. And it's so important to understand that Genesis, uh, Genesis is really not trying to link up uh, with everything scientifically today. Is Genesis 1 and 2, is there some figurative language there? Yes. But I just can't get away. And I'm going to, by the way, you need to know on Forge Facebook for the rest of this week, I'm going to post a couple of different small, short essays on creation and evolution. And I'm going to do a couple other things for you that Genesis doesn't deal with that people are asking today. And you can read those things if you want to. Uh, but, but, uh, but the point that he's trying to say here is that God created mankind. And you read Genesis to Revelation, I can't get away from that. It's there. There is the intentional creation of God. Um, and it's male and female. There it is. Now, is this a worldview issue today, gentlemen? One of the worldview issues that our kids are getting, not in Christian schools, uh, but in secular schools, government schools, is that... There is no God, and evolution is a fact. I find it fascinating as I read the literature that evolution is still called the theory of evolution, even of those who are talking about it. Those who adhere to the theory of evolution and are honest, they say they think the fossil record and they think the human genome studies prove unequivocally that evolution take, takes place but they still call it the theory of evolution. It is not a proven fact. Uh, although you can be a Christian, I'm gonna say this quickly, you can be a Christian and hold to an evolutionary view as long as you believe that God is in the mix. You move God from it, you have an atheistic worldview, a humanistic worldview. Um, but the interesting thing here is it is male and female. And, and so it's, a, it's very simple for us to understand uh, that God determined uh, our, that our anatomy indicates our sex and our gender. It just does. That's the way it is. Uh, and I understand. Now, next week, we're going to look at how broken our world is. See, Genesis 1 uh, and 2 leads up to what? Genesis 3. Because it wants us to understand why are things so weird, broken. Why doesn't everybody agree? Why is there so much conflict? Why even does gender and, and, and human relationships, why are there so many problems? Because of Genesis 3. We'll look at that next week. But the reality is, as we see that man, male and female, is the high and human dignity. Uh, God doesn't make any junk. You're made in the image of God. And it is absolutely crucial for us to understand that you are not the products, the chance products of, 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 of something that crawled out of the primordial soup. And under, under some sort of chemical process that we don't understand, you happen to just evolve into who you are. If that is what happened without the existence of God, you are nothing. You have no worth. As someone said the other day, uh, it doesn't matter what happens to anybody. They had an atheistic worldview. You don't matter. You're a fluke. If you're an, you're an evolutionary mistake, you shouldn't happen. But God created you, and you're made in the image of God, and he knows you by name and by face in Christ. And that means you're, you have dignity. 
And that's why we are relentlessly pro-life as Christians. It's a part of our worldview. That's why we, we hate sex trafficking, because we are relentlessly pro-life. Why we hate abuse of other people uh, of all forms. Why? It's our worldview. Why? Because people are made in the image of God, and they have a dignity. That's why even if someone uh, has less uh, intellectual capacities at birth, why we still think they're worthwhile, because they're made in the image of God. My niece in a home in Alabama uh, has a Down syndrome. She has worth. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. Can sins of sex trafficking and, and abortion, can they be forgiven? Yes, they can be because of the radical nature of the work of Christ. Any sin can be forgiven. Isn't it wonderful? But, but we have to face these things. Men, you have incredible dignity. Don't let anybody tell you that you are not, in Christ, the redeemed son of the Most High God. Don't let people demean you. You don't have to always fight back. It ought to humble us that we are the sons of the one true God. And in Christ, the son of the Savior. Our dignity is settled by that. I love the, uh, in the movie Kingdom of Heaven, uh, you, you may have seen that movie a long time ago. It's one of those I'm stuck on. I see it over and over again. But before the, the, the last battle, uh, the, the, the preacher, well, the, 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 the priest, uh, uh, here's Balian, the leader, say, any man who is, can fight, uh, kneel. Because, because the priest said, we can't win this battle. We have no knights. Balian said, truly. And he made them all kneel, and he made them all knights. And they rose a knight. And you can see, I love the camera as it pans and looks in the men's faces as they become men who realize they've been given a dignity the priest says, does making a man a knight make him a better fighter? Balian says, yes. And you can see it in their faces, and you can see it in the way they fought to protect the people of Jerusalem in the movie. Men, your dignity is way higher than you ever want to understand. And you can ever believe in Christ, you have been restored to the dignity that we'll see is lost in Genesis chapter 3. And then we see also the centrality of the family. Um, I told you there was far more we could talk about in one, but, we'll, but the family's crucial, isn't it? Be fruitful, multiply. Men, one of our greatest tasks is in leading our families. It's crucial. Uh, uh, and, and, and the world that we were given to rule and lead, God gave them. See, we've got to take care of the earth, right? We all believe in creation care. I do. I believe in creation care. Uh, I'm a hunter, but I, I follow the, the laws. Why? Because I want there to be animals there next time. Hunters provide uh, the, the ongoing of so many species, contrary to what people think. Um, but the reality is we had to care for our community, but we, uh, for, for our world, but we got to use it. We got to use it. It was a gift. Well, I give a gift to my kids, and they're not using it. I say, why aren't you using it? This world was for our use. So many things here. What does this tell us? God establishes a covenant uh, with... Uh, with uh, Adam and Eve, and he says, just stay in the garden, cultivate it, keep it. By the way, gentlemen, um, what do we say are our three core values? Uh, we are God's beloved sons through faith in Christ, but we're leaders, workers, and warriors. That all comes from Genesis. That's our worldview. That's a biblical worldview. That's how we see ourselves. That's how we see the world. Team leaders, there's a lot to talk about. You're going to have to pick one topic probably to talk about around the table because the speaker did go over today. And, and there's too much to handle. Go to it. I'll get you out of here on time.
All right, gentlemen. Uh, you never can trust the speaker. Sometimes it goes over. Sorry about that. It took some of your time. There's a lot to work out, isn't there? A uh, lot to work out. Hey, listen, again on the Forge Essentials, I just want to thank you guys uh, as Greg Nelson. Thank you uh, today for your partnership. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, hey, listen, you know, the reality is we need fire teams in a difficult world. Uh, where we're fighting, uh, 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 we need brothers uh, that can stand with us, and uh, that's what a fire team is all about, two to four guys who are fighting for your faith, who you're sharing a little bit more about life with than you do around the table necessarily, uh, but brothers, because brotherhood is a big part of growth in Christ. I need brothers. You need brothers too. Uh, listen, uh, these old booklets are back there if you want to get this. Prayer, one minute prayers. This is the ideal book for you. <laughs> Don't tell me you pray, pray longer than a minute. If you do, that's great. That's great. Spurgeon, Spurgeon said, dads, listen to me on this. Spurgeon said, pray long in private and short in public. Don't make your kids hate your prayers at dinner time by praying the whole Westminster Confession of Faith or whatever. Um, all right, all right. I got to get you out of here, uh, but a couple of things. It is Armed Services Appreciation Week. If you have been or are in the Armed Services, would you please stand? Have been or are. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it's Marine Day, and at uh, Mission Barbecue, if you're Marine, you get free lunch. Army? I don't want that fight in here. You guys get your guns and take it out into the parking lot. There it is. Uh, there it is. It's good to have Second Lieutenant uh, Dawson Cowan with us today. You don't, you don't have uniform on today, but it's good to have you. Newly commissioned. Glad you're with us today. Um, so listen, if you have questions about the uh, uh, Genesis account, you can email me, Pete Alwinson at forgetruth.com. I will try to answer that, but also look uh, later if you do Facebook at the Facebook, uh, Forge Facebook, and I'm going to have a little, I'll have some shorter essays on some of the issues that we're dealing with on this subject. Let me know your questions and I will answer them. Listen, we do live in a world of conflict uh, and uh, uh, but I love the story of this blonde. I'm going to let you out of here after this. This blonde goes into a New York City bank and asks for a loan officer. And, and she says she's going to Europe for two weeks on business and needs to borrow $5,000. So uh, the bank officer says they need some security. So she gives them her Mercedes Benz SL500. The car's parked out in front of the bank. And, and the guy goes out there. They accept the, the Mercedes as collateral. And the bank's president and its officers all enjoy a good laugh for using 110,000 Mercedes Benz for $5,000 collateral. Uh, employee then uh, drives the Benz into the parking garage of the bank and stay there. And, uh, two weeks later, the blonde returns, pays $5,000 back and $15.41 uh, in uh, interest. And the loan officer says, Miss, we're glad uh, to have had business with you. We're glad that you did this, but we just wondered why you put your car up for uh, that collateral. We're a little uh, puzzled. And she said, well, where else in New York City can I park my car for two weeks for only $15.41? <laughs> and expect it to be there when I return, you know? <laughs> Not your typical blonde joke. <laughs> you know, the reality is, is that you are following the biblical narrative. If you follow the biblical narrative, you're smarter than you may look. You're smarter than they may give you credit for. You are building your life on the firm foundation, Jesus said, you are building your life upon the rock. And that is the only way to build a life for yourself and for your wife and for your kids and for your coworkers 
and for those who watch you. Because a life built on sinking sand is eminently forgettable. But God has you here to follow his view of life for such a time as this. Don't forget your dignity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we go out of here today, as we realize that all of this is true because you said Genesis was true, we leave here today asking that you would construct our minds in such a way that we would think your thoughts after you, that we would think like the Bible, that our lens through which we view the world would be biblical. And so help us as we go out there to analyze reality as you would have us, and then to love those who differ with us and kindly point them to you. Give us great wisdom as we live in these culture wars now, for we pray in your strong and holy name. God's man said, amen. amen. Go get them, guys. Go get them. <laughs>